Thank you everyone for joining me today. I hope you're enjoying this Lab Roots event. In this lecture, I'd like to give you a sense of the various forms of artificial intelligence for biological image analysis and how we are using these powerful tools to help researchers and clinicians analyze the information within their stains. AI is integrated into a lot of different fields and we see evidence of the advancements that it enables across our daily lives. Google has developed it to separate buildings and streets from forests and other objects to increase the accuracy of Google Maps. The automotive industry is developing it to analyze visual input and safely maneuver cars to produce autonomous vehicles. These tools are being developed for finding the subtle differences between objects. Researchers and clinicians are also beginning to utilize these powerful AI tools. They are developing these artificial intelligence methods like machine learning and deep learning to help analyze the biological information within staining data to uncover information that could be key for understanding things like how the cells and stroma in their microenvironment are altered to pathologically support tumor growth, seen here with a detailed cellular phenotypic analysis, or to provide a more detailed and accurate assessment for a diagnosis, seen here where we could have AI help us see if the primary tumor has metastasized. The terms artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning are sometimes thrown around interchangeably. I want to define these terms a bit and give some examples to help clarify what they are and how we can use them with image data. I'll quickly run through the artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning hierarchy and give you a couple quick examples of how these terms are applied. I'll then go through our AI classifiers and describe which biological application they are best suited for. Then I'll go through some examples of the best way to use these tools in some staining data. So artificial intelligence is kind of the umbrella term. It's classified as any technique that enables computers to mimic general human behavior. Machine learning is a category of artificial intelligence and is the ability to learn without directly being programmed. So machine learning is a subcategory of artificial intelligence and is an example of an intelligent classifier. It is something that can learn to distinguish things on its own. And then a form of machine learning is deep learning. This is the learning of underlying features in data using deep neural networks, which we'll cover in a minute. So it's really a hierarchy of terminology. Deep learning fits within machine learning, and machine learning fits within artificial intelligence. So down here, you'll see a statement to highlight this. Not all artificial intelligence uses machine learning, and not all machine learning uses deep learning. So when people say, hey, we've got this great new AI algorithm, a lot of people are referring to deep learning, but they're skipping some of the descriptors. Instead of specifically saying we are using a deep learning classifier, which gives you a little bit more information. So be careful when people are talking about AI, because there's a lot of things that are components of AI. So it's sometimes difficult to get a clear idea of what they're talking about, other than the broad sense of something that generally mimics human behavior. So we'll use a thermostat here as an example to highlight some of these differences. So if we start with a thermostat that uses artificial intelligence, most people have used these old school thermostats that allow you to adjust or set temperatures in a room and maybe program times that you want the temperature to be at a certain degree. But all these do is adjust temperatures to automatically turn on heating or cooling units based on set thresholds. And these thresholds could be time or temperature or both. So instead of you having to go turn on the heater when you're cold or turn on the AC unit when you're hot, this will actually mimic that behavior and do it automatically for you. So this would be an example of artificial intelligence. Not very complicated, but it is AI. So it's basically programmable to automatically adjust so you can program it to come on and off during different times or different days. But it doesn't learn. It simply follows the orders that you're giving it. I want the temperature at 72 degrees from 7 in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So it can adjust temperature, but it does so based on your predefined program. That's the simplest form of AI. If we use the same thermostat analogy to describe machine learning, which is a form of artificial intelligence, this would be the Nest thermostat. So many of you have these or know about them, but these are learning thermostats. They use sensory input, primarily motion detectors, to establish if a room is occupied. It has a period of learning so that it can learn occupants' routines based on the sensor input and adjust the temperature based on this routine to conserve energy. So if you're gone for certain hours of the day, it can stop cooling the house down during those times to save energy. And it can predict when you're coming home to start cooling the room down. So this Nest thermostat is defining occupancy as when the motion detector is triggered, 
It then knows that the room is occupied and the correct temperature is maintained. I believe they can also connect to Wi-Fi and use the phone's location within the home to know if there's occupants, if they don't happen to be standing right in front of the thermostat. Either way, the occupancy has a definition. When somebody is in the room or the house, and it can learn routines based on sensory input. So it learns schedules or routines without being directly programmed. So then we have a thermostat that uses deep learning, which is a form of machine learning, which is a form of artificial intelligence. This thermostat uses deep learning, so it uses convolutional neural networks. This thermostat can develop its own definition of occupancy and uses multiple inputs. So it uses motion sensors, sometimes from its own device or other devices in the home. It can use speech recognition, maybe from an Alexa or other inputs that it finds useful to predict or understand what occupancy is. And it is constantly learning from its own learning. And it defines its own definition of occupancy and routines and is constantly adjusting to those things. It can also redefine its definition of occupancy should new data or sensors enter the system or routines change. So as an example, maybe the thermostat is able to connect to the weather and it knows that tomorrow is going to be 15 degrees cooler than it was today and it hears people talking in the home about the weather or that they're cold or maybe their movements are slowed. And so it can proactively increase the temperature by 5 or 10 degrees tomorrow because the weather data is predicting that it'll be a cooler day, for example. So it can utilize all accessible information to make those decisions. And that's what we're really talking about, the power of deep learning that just can't be obtained with machine learning or with the regular thermostat example that we gave before. So just a review, not all artificial intelligence uses machine learning and not all machine learning uses deep learning. So now let's dive into this in a little bit more detail on how they relate to image analysis. All of the classifiers in the software are AI classifiers, but many of them fall into either machine learning or deep learning. We'll start with a threshold classifier as the only AI non-machine learning based classifier. Many of you are already familiar with threshold, especially if you have already worked with image analysis software to some degree. A threshold is simply setting a cut point where the objects or pixels above or below a set value are the objects we want, and the objects or pixels on the other side of the cut point are what we don't want and what we're going to consider background. So in the images on the right here, you can see that in this picture we want to highlight pixels of a certain value that are closer to the white side than the black side. So this is a form of thresholding. So here we have a classifier that simply defines rules or if statements. We program this classifier. There's no learning that takes place. So essentially it's the old thermostat. What temperature do you want? And we'll deliver when we hit that rule set. So in this image on the right, you can see we have these positive nuclei and we just want to tag those pixels that have a certain intensity of brown. So we set a threshold, everything up to 175, and it tags those pixels seen here in green in the following way. And then we could add post-processing steps to clean it up a bit if we want, but simple. If we move to our machine learning classifiers, so these are still AI classifiers, but threshold is not a machine learning classifier, and deep learning is, but we'll talk about this when we get to deep learning. So the three that we have in the software that we categorize as machine learning for this example are k-means clustering, Bayesian, and decision forest. So each of these has a different way of distinguishing their pixels and how they can create groups or classes. k-means can use both supervised and unsupervised learning. And Bayesian and decision forest both use supervised learning, which we'll discuss in the next slide. But basically they're just trying to distinguish different groups on their own. So it's trying to create these cut points to establish these differences. However, these require defined features. Just like thresholding, we have to give it input on what features we want it to utilize to distinguish these objects. So maybe we can create features that highlight the positive nuclei in white, or we use something else that distinguishes the gray regions. Here we have the hemotoxylin feature. But we pick out some feature. Then from there, we have to train the classifier in the case of Bayesian and Decision Forest, we have to paint over the objects that we want and obviously that we don't want, and it will learn how to distinguish this. In the case of k-means, it can do this without supervised learning. So these are intelligent classifiers. We're not actually setting any cut points. We're not programming it. We're just telling it what we want and what we don't want and letting it decide how to categorize those pixels. So now for the deep learning classifier. Deep learning uses things called neural networks, but if it's only one hidden layer, it's not really a deep network. 
you need to have multiple hidden layers. So the network on the left is one layer, and that's really shallow learning. This is still part of machine learning and not considered deep learning. If we talk about deep neural networks, we're talking usually about more than two. Sometimes two is enough, but more than one absolutely to be deep, right? How deep is the network? So when we talk about deep learning in VisioFarm, we're really talking about representational learning or feature learning. We're using these different layers of the network to learn or establish a feature, and we can use both supervised and unsupervised. However, typically we're talking about supervised learning in the context of image analysis in VIS. So if we take an example like this to highlight the difference, if you had a supervised approach, a pathologist based on their prior experience would lay down labels to train the algorithm in this case, green is tumor and blue is stroma, or this is something other than tumor. And the software will learn that feature for us. So it will create a probability map based on one of the classes that we lay down to say this is what we're finding, and this is the probability that it belongs in that class. The goal is that the algorithm can eventually take in new inputs and independently predict the correct label for the data. Unsupervised learning does not require provided labels and corresponding outputs. Instead, the algorithm sifts through the unlabeled input data and identifies patterns it will use to group the data. It is unsupervised because it is not taught with labeled inputs. The algorithm is responsible for analyzing the underlying structure in the data. Either way, we could use these features further down in our analysis. All right, so now that we understand where each of these classifiers fits into those terminology buckets, how do we choose the right classifier? So here we'll outline some questions to ask yourself before choosing a classifier. They're not all the questions you may ask, but they'll give you a head start. So first, how many different pixels or object classes am I trying to separate? Is it two? Is it five? Is it seven? How many classes am I working with? Then are there any pre-analytical variables I need to account for in my image? Are there artifacts, bubbles, or differences in focus? Are there differences in staining intensities? Are there differences in disease states in these images? I just want to point out that these are very critical in choosing a classifier and how to handle that pre-analytical variability. Is there a marker? Is there an IHC or ISH stain? Is it bright field or fluorescence? Is there a special stain? Something that allows me to easily distinguish the pixels or objects that I may want to classify? Or is the analysis relying on the morphology of an object? Is it the shape or texture that is the only thing that distinguishes it from a certain compartment or an object from everything around it? In the same line as the IHC, can I clearly distinguish the object by eye? It may be a single hemotoxylin stain, but I may be able to clearly see the differences between objects based on the intensity of that hemotoxylin or the texture of it that I may be able to utilize. Lastly, how soon do I need the results? I know this may seem like an odd one, but some of these classifiers take time. So if it's not something that you need tomorrow or next week, or you're using it routinely, you may choose to use a different classifier that just gets you the answer right now, and you move on. So I'm going to give you a couple examples here. On the first one, we're going to want to separate tissue from glass, which is just generating a region of interest around the tissue. In this example, we have two joints, and they have different special stains on them. So going back to our questions here, how many classes do I need here to separate tissue from glass? This is just two classes, tissue and glass. Do I have any pre-analytical variables? Yes, they have considerable differences in the stains of each of these joints that have to be handled by the classifier. Is it distinguishable by eye? Yes, it's easy to see the differences between tissue and glass in this example. Is there a clear color contrast? Absolutely, just like if it was distinguishable by eye, we can clearly see where the tissue is and where the glass is. So it's easily distinguishable with a clear color contrast. Does it rely on morphology? No. In this regard, we have the color. We don't need anything morphologically to tell us what these compartments are. So how quickly do I need it? I need it now. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time building an app to segment these two things. Unless it's something that I'm doing all the time, there's a lot of pre-analytical variables such as folds or other differences, bubbles or artifacts that I need to overcome on a routine basis. So I want it now. This is just one study. I want to get through it and get the data. So based on these answers, I would say that deep learning and thresholds are avenues that I wouldn't take. Deep learning simply because of the time. There's really no need to build the training data set and train and learn classifiers for something as simple as tissue versus glass because there's a clear contrast. 
we don't need the deep learning network to find features for us. We can easily see those features. And threshold, although it could be used because there's a lot of variance in the staining or pre-analytical variability in the different stains, it'll just take me a little bit longer to use threshold than it would to use an intelligent classifier here. So you could use it, but again, how quickly now? Not going to use threshold. So Bayesian, just paint on tissue, paint on glass. This is a quick, easy result. Decision force looks very similar. It's a little more pixelated in this case, but nothing that post-processing can't handle. And then k-means clustering looks very similar to Bayesian and decision forest. You can pick whichever one you want in this case. k-means has its own caveats, which we'll get to in the next example. But any of these machine learning classifiers, except for deep learning, would work well in this example. So in this example, we want to know what regions or percent of the tissue is invasive or cancerous tissue, which is a CK719 positive. To do this, we need to quantify the areas of CK7 and 19 positive tissue and the areas of CK7, 19 negative tissue. We also want to recognize and exclude the glass areas so that we get a good denominator in terms of our tissue sample. If we run down our questions, how many classes do we want to separate? In this case, we have three. We have a CK719 positive, a CK719 negative, and the glass. Is there any pre-analytical variability? In this case, no. The staining is pretty consistent, and we don't have a whole lot of variability across our sample. We have a clear contrast and a great signal to noise. I'm not worried about any pre-analytical variables for this specific sample. Is it distinguishable by eye? Yes, we have a CK719 marker for it. Is there a clear color contrast? Yes, we have an easily distinguishable compartment. No need to worry about that. Does it rely on morphology? No, because we have that clear color contrast in the marker. You do not need to use the texture context of those compartments. How quickly do I need it? I'd like it now. If I had just separated tissue and glass, and this was just the same study, and I wanted to now distinguish these compartments, and I spent the time working up these assays, I should get it pretty readily. There's no reason to make a super robust learning classifier out of this. So deep learning is really the one that I would remove because we have all the other things that are telling us to use a machine learning classifier or threshold to do this. So the first one here is Bayesian. You paint where the CK719 positive areas are, where the CK719 negative areas are, and where the glass areas are, and it simply learns this. Super easy, and you could post-process to clean this up. Decision Forest gives us almost the exact same thing. K-means, on the other hand, we just used an unsupervised approach here where we just said we have three classes, find them. You can see here that it distinguishes things a bit differently. And that's one of the caveats with K-means. It kind of does its own thing on the unsupervised front. You can definitely train it, but if you don't have these classes represented in each field of view, it'll have to always lay these classes down. So K-means is typically one that I don't use very often just because of this need for it to lay down the class every single time. And lastly, we have threshold, which looks very similar to the decision forest and Bayesian. So in this regard, you could use all four of these. I probably would stick with threshold, Bayesian, or decision forest, but it's completely up to you. The last example deals with tumor burden. So let's say we just have a hemotoxylin stain and we want the area of the tumor and the area of the sample. So we'll go back to our questions. How many classes do we have? Two, we have a tumor and everything else. Do you have any pre-analytical variables? Yes, there's differences in disease severity, just within the same tissue, but also among different samples. So we'll need to be aware of the variability of what the tumor is, what the normal compartments are, things like that. Is it distinguishable by eye? Yes, a trained eye can easily see where the tumor is and where the non-tumor areas are. Is there a clear color contrast? No, some of these areas here, you can see the lymphoid components and things or the connective tissue. They have similar color, but they don't provide a whole lot of contrast. However, the texture creates a nice contrast and the density of these different nuclei, but there's not really a clear color contrast. Does it rely on morphology? Yes, that's what I mean by the texture or density of these nuclei or the shape of them. We can tell that they are using nonlinear human logic to say, okay, the nuclei are this size, they're kind of clustered together, they're creating some shapes that look irregular compared to the normal compartments. So that's what I'm classifying as tumor. How quickly do I need this? In this case, it doesn't matter because we really only have one option, and that's deep learning. None of these other classifiers are going to get us the robustness that we need to classify these objects on a routine basis. So we train a deep learning classifier and we get our results. 
So in summary, thresholding is one of the easiest classifiers to use and gives you ultimate control, but it relies on advanced development of features to become as robust as the machine learning classifiers, except deep learning. Deep learning is one of those classifiers that because it generates its own features, you don't need to spend a whole lot of time on that. So you should be using threshold when you have high contrast between objects that does not rely on morphometry, and you need a result faster than the time it takes to train a deep learning classifier. One of the things I'd like to point out here is the ultimate control. So the nice thing about thresholding is if you go to a new study and it's simply a difference in, let's say, nuclear intensity or the marker of interest, its intensity has changed, but it's consistent. You can quickly fine tune that and you don't have to train anything. It's just ready to go. The remaining machine learning classifiers, which are k-means, Bayesian, and decision forest, everything other than deep learning, can quickly tackle most image analysis tasks, and each has a slight advantage. You can use these for quick app development when contrast between objects being classified as high and the need for tunability is low. So if you need a lot of tunability, I would go with the threshold, but otherwise, if you have high contrast, feel free to use any of the machine learning classifiers besides deep learning. Deep learning can be used to classify nearly everything, but it requires developing a robust training set and time to learn, which is why the time constraints that we highlighted in the examples are something that you need to assess up front. So use deep learning when morphometry is really the only differentiator, and or the study has high heterogeneity in either disease or pre-analytical variabilities. Deep learning is really the best classifier, but it does take time. We have some other webinars where we really focus solely on deep learning, how to use it, how to train it, how to quality control its performance, things like that. But I hope today was a nice general summary of how to differentiate AI, machine learning, and deep learning, and how those kind of fit in within the software, and how we can utilize that terminology more appropriately. One more important thing to take away is that AI is not really similar to how the human brain works. This is very complicated, and there are teams of researchers that are currently trying to reverse engineer these mechanisms. However, this technology uses mathematical models that are inspired by the human brain. Each of these are a unique and powerful entity on their own, but both of these tools working together can greatly improve outcome. And for me, it is really fun to see how AI is helping the field of healthcare evolve and advance. Thanks for your time today, and be sure to check out our virtual booth in the exhibition hall Thank you for listening and have a great day.